I think he's already answered. It took Skip to be with him. And uh, there were some great times going over there to see him. And Joe and I, on Wednesdays was our visitation day. And that was, that was some great experience. So glad we went the Wednesday before he passed. We just felt like in our hearts we needed to get over there to check on him. And sure enough, and about 24 hours later, he went on to be with the Lord. I had many good conversations with Skip about salvation, to explain it to him in a more detail, and about heaven. Talked to him about both of those the first few years he was here. Today I wanted to gear, gear the message towards uh, Skip in honor of him. And it just, the, the title just came out out of my heart. I, I was thinking about doing something about heaven. And I can't, I can't explain it except I felt God inspired me to give the, the title, What's So Great About Heaven? And I said, you better find the answer, better find out. Because you're going to be there for an awfully long time. Father in heaven, thank you for, for Skip and for Linda. And Father, I thank you that you will inspire us today with your word, that it will be an inspiration to us all. And we give you thanks in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I asked the question again, what's so great about heaven? And the clear answer is just one word, everything. Everything is what's so great about heaven. In the Old Testament, the prophet Ezekiel was one of those few people that had that incredible experience to have a vision of the throne room of Almighty God. Now, you know, up to that point, nobody had that kind of a experience recorded that we know of. But Ezekiel all of a sudden had this vision of the glory of God and of the throne room of God. 800 years to the day almost, another prophet had another vision of the throne room, and his name was Isaiah. And what was so interesting, even though 800 years apart, when you read the account of what they experienced, it's the same place, the same throne room, and some of the same description. Then John, in the New Testament, sees the same throne room as well. In the scripture of John 14, 1 and 2, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Some translations say rooms. It proclaims heaven as a very large place. If it were not so, I would have told you. He's speaking firsthand knowledge. I go to prepare a place for you. Refers to him personally superintending this project in heaven. Now, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Ed, I've been to the Grand Canyon. Oh, man. Look out over that Grand Canyon. And some people call it the treasure of heaven, you know. You look and see that the beauty of the Grand Canyon. It's an amazing experience to, to see that. But I want to tell you something. That 2,000 years ago, we know that Christ died on the cross, and he said, I'm going to come back, and he came back, and then he said, I'm going to leave, and I'm going to prepare a place for everybody. 2,000 years ago, Jesus says, I'm going back and I'm going to prepare a place for all those who believe in me. Now, he's been working on this for 2,000 years on this project. Pretty good. Now, 
if God created the heavens in six days and rested on the seventh, and I think if you look outside today, it's a beautiful day. If you go to the Canyon or travel other places, in those six days, God did a pretty good job, right? But listen to this. Jesus has been working on our place up there for 2,000 years. Man, it's going to be nice. And that's why this verse explains it in 1 Corinthians 2, 9. I has not seen, an eye has not seen this, nor an ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. The wonders of God. Verse 10 says, He reveals it through His Holy Spirit. He reveals the wonders of God by His Spirit. In verse 10. Did you know that heaven is mentioned in the Bible more than 500 times? Wow. Did you also know that after many scholarly studies concerning thousands of patients with NDE or near-death experiences shared in the most prestigious medical journals, many in that community have come to the conclusion, and I'm glad they did, there is life after death. In fact, I, I just, when I was studying and looking this up, by 2011, there had already been about a thousand cases that were presented in different medical journals, such as American Journal of Psychiatry and the British Journal of Psychiatry and a few more uh, prestigious journals that stories were revealed. Now, I have to say that sometimes I'm a little bit skeptical of some of, of, some of the accounts I've heard of near-death experiences, but some of them are just really right on and pretty amazing. I went through the scriptures that you can do as well, and I title it this way. Let's first talk about the many things that won't be in heaven that makes it heaven. Now, I know you're going to think it a little bit humorous on the first one there. I saw Nancy already laughing at me a little bit. And I told Joan when we were typing it, she says, you, you going to put that in there? I said, well, you have to because the Bible says it. Uh, now, the Bible does say that there will be no Mary or given in marriage in heaven. Now, for some people that uh, have a good marriage, it may be a little disappointing. For those who haven't had such a good marriage, maybe you'll be delighted. But they'll neither be married nor given in marriage in heaven. There'll be no death. Neither can they die anymore. Luke 20, 36. Well, that sounds good to me. Jesus, while he was on this earth for a very short period of time, he went to the grave of Lazarus. And the, this is the shortest verse in the Bible. The Bible says Jesus wept. Now let me, let me talk about a minute. The Son of God, the Son of Man, God incarnate, goes to the graveside of Lazarus and he weeps. And the big question to me is, why? Because in just a matter of seconds, he's going to bring him back to life. So why is he weeping? Because in a matter of a little bit, he's going to call Lazarus, come forth. And out of that tomb, Lazarus is going to come forth. And then he says, loose him, because he's all wrapped up in burial bandages that they did in that time period. So they had to loose him. But he was back to life. That was a pretty amazing thing. But the reason that he cried, I believe, and this is personal opinion, I believe the reason that Jesus wept is because he looked down through time and he knew how hard it was going to be to lay our loved ones down. 
And I believe he wept for all of us. He wept for us because he knew how difficult it would be to lay our loved ones down in death. I laid my mother, my father, I even spoke a little bit at their service, not a lot, but a little bit. It's very difficult to do. And I, a few years ago, I took my brother over to Burger King, and he went to see the King of Kings at Burger King. That's a really interesting thing. He died at Burger King. I was over ordering and getting his food. He's at the table with Joan waiting on us to get his food. But she never ate. Because at that table, he slipped away to be with the Lord. We were singing, How Glorious You Are, a year ago, Sunday. And Ed was singing, leading the song, How Glorious You Are. You make things glorious. And I had my phone in my pocket on vibrate. My sister was in the hospital in Moore County. And I wanted them to call me when she passed. And while we were singing, Lord, you make all things glorious. My phone began to vibrate. And I knew that was when my sister went to be with the Lord. It's amazing things. No more death, neither shall they die anymore. And in Revelation 21, 4, there'll be no more sorrow, there'll be no more crying, and there'll be no more pain. Wow. I saw my sister go through so much pain. She had Parkinson's, and she had hepatitis C. She had everything going. But she was very victorious through all those things. And in Revelation 7, 17, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Wow. And there, no more after that. This is interesting. In Matthew 6, 20, Lay up treasures in heaven, he says, where there are no moths, no rust to corrupt. I pull this hat out to wear today because to honor Skip. Haven't worn it in church. Haven't worn it hardly anywhere. And I had it stored away. And I think a few moths sort of got onto one part of it, just a little bit. But in heaven, he says, lay up treasures. There's no moths and there's no rust to corrupt. And I like this next one, guys. I have to say I like this one. No thieves or keys in heaven. I love it. Guys, I hate keys. I, I hate keys with a passion. I hate locks and I hate messing with keys. Hate them. And the only reason we have keys is because of the fall of Adam, because mankind fell. That's the only reason why we have keys. Wouldn't it be great to live in a world where you never had to have keys and locks because there was no problem, nobody would ever do anything wrong? Well, I'm afraid that's not going to be in this world. It's gonna, you got to wait to the other world where no thieves approaches Luke 12 33 no thieves and no keys I love that I think some people like keys they, they wear these big old blob on the side of the man I tell you what I cut those babies off I don't like those things Revelation 21 7 no pollution no wise enter in to heaven anything that defiles nothing no pollution nothing that will defile abomination Revelation 21 27 neither whatsoever works of abomination will be in heaven and I like Revelation 22 3 curse no more curse. No more curse. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, there was the curse upon man. 
Christ came to lift the curse spiritually. In heaven there will be no curse. There shall be no curse. Revelation 22, 3. On the back of your sheet. Now the many wonders of heaven that we know that makes heaven heaven. Or heavenly. First of all, in heaven there is the house of the Lord. That's a good neighborhood to live in, huh? Yeah, they sell in real estate. It's all location, location, location. He says in Psalms 23, 6, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. The house of the Lord's there in heaven. God's throne is in heaven. Psalms 11, 4. The Lord's throne is in heaven. Our Savior, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who came and lived on this earth for a short period of time and sinless life, died on the cross, rose from the dead, you'll see him. Behold, in Acts 7, 56, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man, that is Christ our Lord. In Revelation 4, 3, if you like rainbows, the Bible says there's a rainbow, and there was a rainbow around the throne. Wow, Joan likes rainbows. Be around the throne of God. A sea of glass, Revelation 4, 6, and there was a sea of glass likened unto crystal. Wow. Wow. And in John 17, 24, all the saints, the believers that have received Christ as their Savior, Father, I will, they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am. I'm here glad that Christ told the Father, those you've given me, I want them to be with me where I am. And then in Revelation 4, 4, we have the 24 elders. Around about the throne were the 24 elders. You're going to see some people that you read about in this Old Testament. You're going to say, man, I'm looking forward to meeting them. I heard about a meeting in heaven where this guy wanted to share his experience about the Jonestown flood. And the Lord said, Peter said, well, it's okay. You're, you can share that with everybody. Just remember, Noah's going to be in the audience. Okay. Interesting, huh? Now, how many like books? Joan loves books. We got so many books, we don't know where to put them all. Revelation 20, 12, and the books were open, and another book opened. It was called the Book of Life. Amen. Treasures, Matthew 19, 21. The wonders of heaven will conclude treasures, and you shall have treasure in heaven. Yes. He says, don't try to hold on to it here. Don't see too many U-Hauls behind the hearse, do you? And in Ephesians 1.18, that ye might know the riches of the glory of his inheritance. Riches in heaven. Fountains, Revelation 7.17, and shall lead them unto living fountains of water. Wow. Rivers in heaven. Revelation 22, 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life. Tree. Revelation 22, 2. On either side of the river were the tree of life. Timelessness. Spoken of throughout the Bible, which is referred to the word eternity. Joy and pleasures. People like pleasures? Well, there's going to be a lot of great pleasures in heaven. And Psalm 1611, In 
your presence is fullness of joy. And at your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Wow. How many is looking for that? Now I get excited about this. New glorified bodies. I don't know about you, but sometime when I wake up in the morning, I'm ready for an upgrade. I mean, it's ready for an upgrade. Man, are we ready? And look what 1 Corinthians 15, 49, you'll love that passage. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, so we shall someday have a body like Christ. Could I say, wow? Now, let's talk about an upgrade of a spiritual body. Most scholars believe the upgrade of a spiritual body will resemble the body that Christ had when he was resurrected. If you remember on the Emmaus Road, he was walking with the disciples. It took a while for them to know who he was, but he was walking with them. He was eating fish with them also on the side of the bay. I mean, he could walk, he could eat fish, he could be touched. He told Thomas, put your hand in my side. Because doubting Thomas wasn't sure if that was the Christ who had come back to life. He said, put your hand with a spear. See my hands where the nails were put in it. Thomas said, my Lord and my God. I mean, he's ready for an upgrade in a new body. This is, this, is, this is good, people. When you get to heaven, not only are you going to want to see the Savior who died, gave his life for your sins, not only are you going to visit some of your family members that have gone on before you, people that you cared for on this earth, but you're going to have the opportunity to see millions, millions of children because of miscarriages, because of abortions. You are going to be privileged to see. The Bible says that when you were in the womb, I knew you. I knew you while you were in the womb. And listen what he says. It is not, in Matthew 18, 14, it is not the will of the Father that any of these little ones perish. There's going to, listen, you're going to be, there's going to be so many beautiful children. Now, some scholars believe they will grow to a mature age. That's what many scholars look that have studied everything the scripture teaches and the way that it would may work that direction. But there will be children in heaven, perhaps millions of children. And besides that, besides your Savior, your loved ones, old Skip, we're going to see him. I bet he has a 10-gallon hat even there. I don't, God will probably give it to him. Let him have it. Okay, Skip, you wore one down there. You can wear one up here. But besides all of that, you're going to be able to visit with the Old Testament, New Testament characters of the Bible. That's what's so great about heaven. And I think, I've never really spent a lot of time thinking about it, but we're going to interact with millions and millions and millions that I can't even name of angels. Let me tell you this. The Bible speaks of the angels of heaven as being innumerable. Now, there was one-third that rebelled, that are demons and a part of Satan's rebellion, but two-thirds did not rebel. Sometimes we put too much emphasis on the one-third and not the two-thirds. But the way the Scripture gives it to us, they are described as being innumerable. I just think if you were to 
uh, uh, usually football stadium holds 50,000. If you take 50,000 in a stadium and you multiply that by 2,000 stadiums, you have 100 million. Well, uh, 100 million is just getting started. Look at the scripture, what it says about angels. And I heard the voice of many angels about the throne. 10,000 times 10,000 times thousands of thousands. Now, why is the word 10,000 significant? The reasons why it's significant, in the Greek language, the numerical number of 10,000 was the highest number that could be translated. That's all they knew. Now, we, we talk in billions and trillions today, but in the Greek language at that time, 10,000 was the largest number. So when you understand what's being said there, 10,000 times 10,000 times thousands, Thousands of thousands, and then in Revela in another place in Hebrews 12:22, it speaks the word innumerable, innumerable. In other words, there's so many angels, it's just you can't wrap your mind around it. You can't count them. So, when you get to heaven, you have your loved ones, you have your Savior, you you have the characters of the Bible, the Old and New Testament. You have people that you love dearly in this life that are there to meet you. And then you have all these children to interact with. And then you have all these angels that are without number that you can interact with. Now, to me, that is pretty amazing. And yes, Skip, there's horses. I mean, for, for, for Skip, it wouldn't be heaven if there weren't a horse. Revelation 12, 11, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and him that sat on it was called Faithful and True, our, our Savior himself. So Skip had a lot in common with Christ, because Christ is going to be on a white horse coming right out of the heavens. Man. Now, it's kind of interesting about um, Mark Twain. I love the guy. I love his wit and humor. I've used it in public schools. I travel from here to California speaking in public schools, anti-drug motivational life programs from here to California. And I use Mark Twain a lot in my storytelling that I gave. But one of his remarks I didn't really care for, and I know it was based on some ignorance. Mark Twain said, well, sitting on a cloud, Playing a harp for eternity sounds awfully boring. But it may have been just his humor, or maybe he really believed that, I don't know. But we cannot comprehend all the glorious work which we will be occupied with during eternity, throughout eternity. Randy Alcorn is a great writer, and he wrote several books on heaven, which is a great, he's a great author and very prolific writer. This is a good quote from him that I picked up for today. We cannot possibly comprehend all the glorious work with which we will be occupied throughout eternity, but we know that our service will result in deep joy and fulfillment. What will it be like in heaven to perform a task, to build, and to create, knowing that what we're doing will last forever and ever? Think about it. What we're doing will last forever and ever. Now that will give a, a, a tradesman a real satisfaction to know everything you're building will never be torn down, will never rot, will never be wasted. What will it be like to always be gaining skills so that our best work will always be ahead of us? Because our minds and bodies will never fade and because we will never lack resources and opportunity, our work won't 
disintegrate. Buildings won't last for just for 50 years, and books won't be in print for just 20 years. They'll be forever. So whatever you do, whatever assignment, whatever creativity that God allows you to do things in heaven, we're not going to be sitting around on a cloud playing a harp for eternity. We're going to be creating people doing great things that we can never imagine in our minds today. Man, heaven's a real place. And I'll tell you what, buddy. Randy Aircoin said, don't cross your fingers when it comes to heaven. Better go to the cross. Don't cross your fingers. Well, so I've asked people, do you think you're going to go to heaven? Well, I, I don't know. Well, you better know. It's too big a deal. And one thing I can declare to you to, today, sitting down with Skip, he, he came to understand exactly what it meant to be ready to live with in God's house forever. What an incredible time together. Let's stand together and we'll take a break and we're going to finish this service to honor Skip in just a few moments.